Good day and hello once again. <clears throat> My name is Fitz Bramble and I'm back with you for another session of the NDP e-lessons um, in CSEC economics. Uh, last session ended with a discussion or uh, continuing the discussion on the nature of economics. And if you recall, during the last session, we talked about the basic economic problem of scarcity and choice because of the fact that we have limited resources which must be utilized to produce goods and services to satisfy our unlimited wants and needs. Now, very important in this whole setup. In, and, and in looking at the nature of economics and the basic economic problem of scarcity and choice and attempting to answer the questions of what to produce, how to produce it, and for whom to produce, you notice there's one common denominator in all of this, and it's produce. So in order for us to have or in order for the goods and services to be available to satisfy our wants and needs, those goods and services must be produced. And in the production process, in the process, in the activities of making, of producing goods and services, there are some things which we refer to as the factors of production. In other words, your inputs. What do you use in order to produce or to make goods and services? So the factors of production are actually the inputs used to make goods and services. They refer to the, to the resources required, the resources that are necessary to produce a good or service. And these factors of production are categorized as follows. We have what is called land or natural resources. And then we have labor, which is also sometimes referred to as human capital. And then we have capital and the fourth category is referred to as entrepreneurial ability. Now let's look at these factors of production one by one so that we have a clear understanding of what they mean and how, to some extent, how do they factor into the production process? Land. Land or natural resources are required in the production process. And land refer to gifts of nature, in other words. Your marine resources, the sea, the oceans, the, the actual land that you farm or you drill for oil um, and other raw materials which come from nature, that is referred to as land or natural resources. Labor or human capital is required or the human resources required in the production process. And this includes all type of work by humans, by us, whether we are very skilled as a, as a, a, a computer technologist or whether we are just... Um, working as a part-time unskilled laborer at, say, KFC. All of that comes under the rubric, under the category of labor or human capital. And later on, as you go through the course, you would be able to make that connection or understand the term human capital um, in a more detailed way. Capital which is the third factor of production, is the manufactured or physical resources required in the production process. So for example, your computer, 
the factory, the, 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 the tractor trailer, the truck, you know, the pickaxe, the shovel, all of those things that you use, all of those physical goods that you use to produce other goods, those are referred to as capital. And I know the question maybe you ask, well, why, um, if, if, if you have, let's say, a shovel, which is considered as a capital good, well, what was used to produce that shovel? You know, so it, it, it can be a bit of a ticklish area in determining or, or identifying examples of capital goods from time to time. But at this level, at the CSEC level, you don't need to get into too much of that. I mean, when you, when you get into high-level economics and you start looking at the production function and you start looking at your labor to capital ratio and all of those kinds of things, then that sort of a gray area may come into play. But for right now, just suffice it to say that capital is the manufactured of physical resources required in the production process. And then fourthly, we have entrepreneurial ability, which is the ability to bring all of these factors of production together. And of course, that would be done by a human uh, being, an individual, a person. The, you know, they must have the skills uh, most times in a business sense, to bring or to combine the labor and the capital, you know, and the land. How much land do you need to produce um, five tons of bananas? And how many farmers do you need to farm that amount of land to produce five tons of bananas? That is where the entrepreneurial ability or the skills of that business person in combining and managing the other resources come into play. So um, entrepreneurial ability is also a factor of production. An entrepreneur, just in case you're wondering, is someone who operates, generally it's someone who operates a business, someone who brings together the factors of production in order to produce goods and services. Usually to make a profit, but again, Later on in the, in the discussion, in the syllabus, discussing the syllabus, we would get into a little bit more of that. So, when you're producing goods and services to satisfy your wants and needs, the factors of production are required in order to produce the goods and services in the production process. And by extension, um, there must be payment for these factors of production because they're owned the factors of production are owned, and so in the process of using these factors of production, payment must be made for them. So let's quickly talk about the payment for the different factors of production. What are they? All right, the payment for the factors of production for land the payment is referred to as rent the reward for land is called rent rental income comes from the ownership of property and when we say rent I mean we have a very basic understanding of for example if you own an apartment and somebody wants to stay in there, you rent it to them. So they're paying you to use your property. Um, if you have a, a piece of land that you, somebody's farming for you, they want to pay to use it. So the payment for land is referred to as rent. And rental income comes from the ownership of the property, such as um, you know, your physical and, and, and other types of assets. And it's paid by the tenants of the land resources. Um, and again, as we go further into the syllabus, we would get into uh, some more detailed discussions on that. The reward for labor is referred to as wages and salaries. Wages and salaries. So you work, you get paid as a human being, as a human resource, that labor resource. Some people get paid daily, some people get paid by the hour, some people get paid by the week, 
every two weeks, every month. But um, the payment for labor is referred to as wages and salaries, and these are paid to the workers. The reward for capital is known as interest. And there's an interesting connection here, or, 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 or the description for the reward for capital as interest, because interest is usually referred to as that payment that you have to pay to the bank or to the financial institution when you use people's money, when you borrow money, when you get a loan. So in the investment process, and again, I don't want to jump the gun here and get into, get into too, too much of an advanced discussion at this juncture, but when you obtain capital goods, if you're going to build a factory or you're going to buy a truck or you're going to you know, invest in some computers or what have you, generally speaking, you probably get a loan from somewhere and the interest that you have to pay on the loan is referred to as the payment for the capital goods that you're going to use, that you're going to purchase or obtain with the loan that you get from the bank. A lot of people um, at face value consider capital as money. I recall somebody in one of the earlier um, um, uh, discussions was saying, well, they always thought that capital was, was money. But capital is actually, there's an interesting connection, as I said before, between the money that you use to obtain the capital goods in the product, to, to be used in the production process. So interest, if the interest rate is high, obviously it becomes less worthwhile for the business and households to borrow money for production. So if there's a high interest rate, you're more than likely not going to borrow money at all or not borrow as much to you know, invest in whatever you want, to, you want that money to, to be used for. Um, and again, as we get into the deeper into the, 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 the syllabus and we start looking at money markets and stuff like that, and we start looking at interest rates, we start looking at monetary policy and these kinds of things, this concept of interest would be revisited. All right? And finally, for entrepreneurial ability, the payment is referred to as profit. When you use your skills and your expertise and your talent to, um, to put together all of these resources, all of the other uh, factors of production and to manage them, and you run a business successfully, you earn a profit. A profit is basically the money that you have left back after you've taken care of all your expenses. Okay? That's your, your revenue minus your cost. And that, again, we will get into at some point in the future in the syllabus. So those are the, 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 the four different payments for the factors of production. For land, it's rent. For labor, it's wages and salaries. Capital, it's interest. And entrepreneurial ability is profit. You need to know these because these are going to come up on your CSEC exams. You just have to know them. You might see some multiple, multiple choice question. might say the payment for capital is A, interest. B, Two mangoes. C, a roast breadfruit. D, wages. You know, so you just have to know them. All right? Um, but all together or collectively, the four rewards or the rewards for all of the factors of production is referred to as income. Income. And again, later on in the, in the syllabus, we revisit that and talk about national income and get into a little bit of talking about aggregate income and, and, and these kinds of things. But for right now, um, that, is, that is where we are. All right? Now, let's move on to another concept related, but very, very important, and a concept which warrants its own discussion time. And this is referred to, or this concept is referred to as the production possibilities curve or frontier. Now, what does this mean and where does it come from? Well, let, let me, before I get into the actual um, 
definition and so on. Let, let's just set the stage here. So recall, recall very clearly that the basic, the, 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 the economic problem, the basic economic problem of scarcity and choice means that we have to make trade-off, trade-offs. We have to make choices. We cannot have all of everything at the same time. Okay? Um, how does this concept uh, explain or reflect the constraints of an economy? By that I mean, well, how does this concept of not having enough resources to satisfy the unlimited wants and needs, how does that affect all of us in an economy? And one way of explaining that, one way of explaining that is through the production possibilities curve or frontier. Because, like I said a while ago, in order to produce, in order to, to, to obtain or to have the goods and services available to satisfy our unlimited wants and needs, we have to produce them. And in the process of producing the goods and services, there are a number of things which come into play. One is the production possibilities frontier, which highlights the limitations that we have confronting us or facing us, and hence our reason for making choices or having to make choices. So the production possibilities curve or frontier shows the maximum, and you, you need to pay attention to this, and if you need to pause the video and write this down, because as a, in the interest of time, I'm not going to write out the definition on the whiteboard, but I'll give you the definition and you can make your note of it or refer to your textbook. It's a very, very important fundamental concept in economics at any level, so you need to know. You just need to remember what the production possibilities curve is, and then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some of the features of the, the PPF. Um, so the production possibilities curve or frontier shows the maximum attainable combination of two products that may be produced with available resources and your current technology. So in other words, whatever the resources are available in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, whatever combination of two goods that those resources can produce, that maximum amount or that maximum quantity at any given point in time with the given technology would be reflected on the production possibilities frontier. It shows the maximum combination of any two categories of goods and services that can be produced in, in an economy at any point in time. So, in other words, it essentially shows the production possibilities frontier essentially shows the productive capacity of an economy or of the economy. What's the maximum quantity of goods and services that our given resources at that point in time can produce? All right? So let's do a picture of the production possibilities frontier to, to help you to better understand what the concept really entails and, and the dynamics, the workings of, of um, the production possibilities curve. All right? So we're going to, let's say we're talking about two products. And I'm assuming that you have already done the dynamics of a graph, a linear graph. So I don't have to explain to you about the x and the y axis, the vertical and the horizontal axis, and how the values increase from the origin outwards and all of that sort of stuff. If you haven't already done that, um, I'm sure that you'll get to that with your teacher. And if it's really a challenge, then you can always send us a message in our inbox, um, Facebook and uh, YouTube, NDP, and, uh, and we will get, I'll get back to you. So 
here's your vertical axis and here's your horizontal axis. So the values increase on the horizontal axis, which is this one. The values increase from left to right, from zero, which is your origin. I think I have to wait for the whiteboard to dry. And this is your vertical axis. And the values increase from bottom to top um, on the vertical axis. So let's talk about two products. Let's say we're going to measure wooden furniture on the vertical axis and coconut oil on the horizontal axis. Okay? And let's say that given the resources available to us, our production possibilities curve looks like this. If I, if I had more time and maybe if it was a bit more interactive, we could have gone through the step-by-step -step construction of the production possibilities curve. But it's not practical so to do right now. So just uh, accept that this is what the production possibilities curve for economy, economy um, Zynga uh, in, in this example. So let's call this point A on the production possibilities curve. At point A, at point A, you're producing or the economy zinger, I just give it a name that came to my head. That economy will be able to, be put to will be able to produce a hundred units of wooden furniture, let's say a hundred couches, and zero coconut oil. In other words, at point A, this economy will choose the choice that this economy has made for whatever reason and how, how they go about making that choice is something that again we will talk about later on in the syllabus depending on what type of economy it is depending on who manages and controls the re and owns the resources and so on and so forth but for right now let's just assume that at point a the economy chooses to use all of its resources available to it to produce only wooden furniture and in that case you would produce a hundred units of wooden furniture and zero units of uh, coconut oil. Let's take the other extreme and go down to point B on the production possibilities frontier or curve which is down here on the horizontal axis and we say that if the economy chooses to use all of its resources to produce at point B what this is saying is that the economy has decided to use, to produce all coconut oil and zero furniture. So here at point B, the economy will produce 100 gallons of coconut oil with the resources available to it and zero, um, zero wooden furniture. Of course, the assumption is that the resources are, are, are um, transferable. So you can use them to, come to, to produce one or the other or a combination of the two. That is the assumption that, that we have made. And I think it's a reasonable assumption. All right. So let's, how about let's pick in another point on the production possibilities front and calling it point C. And at point C, now this economy utilizes its resources to produce some wooden furniture and some coconut oil. In this example, let's say that it produces 80 units of wooden furniture and 80 units of coconut oil. And again, as we go through the, the syllabus, you will, you will, I will explain to you later on, um, you know, the, 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 the concept of, the concept of, um, of increasing cost, uh, increasing marginal cost, and so on and so forth, as you produce an extra unit of coconut oil, it'll become more and more expensive, or you'll have to give up more and more wooden furniture and so on and so forth. Don't worry about that too much just yet. We're not there as yet in the syllabus, but just to give you a heads up, because I'm, I'm sure some of you probably starting to ask those types of questions. This is not the time for us to address that issue just yet. But, so at point C, on the production possibilities curve, on the production possibilities frontier, uh, Economy Zynga produces 80 units of wooden furniture, 80 couches, and 80 gallons of coconut oil. Let's choose a different point on the production possibilities curve. Let's call this point D. 
at point D, you can see now that economy Zenga, point D is 100, at point D, economy Zenga has chosen to produce less wooden furniture, so maybe 70 instead of 80, which it produced at combination C, and more coconut oil. Let's say 90 gallons of coconut oil instead of 80. So immediately, right here, you can see a very interesting occurrence. As the economy of Zenga made two different choices, you can see something happening here, very interesting. When the economy chose um, combination C, you saw that the economy produced 80 units of wooden furniture and 80 gallons of coconut oil. But when it moved from point C to point D, in other words, when the economy made a different choice, instead of choosing combination C, the economy decided to choose combination D. In that process, in that process, you can clearly see that the economy had to give up, had to give up some, the production of some wooden furniture in order to produce more coconut oil. And if you recall earlier, in the early, one of the earlier sessions, we talked about the concept of opportunity cost, giving up something to get something else. Well, that's what's happening here. That is because of the concept of trade-offs. You have to make a trade-off because we do not have unlimited resources to satisfy our unlimited wants and needs. So you, you, you see the connection. It, it, it all comes back to that basic concept that basic economic problem of satisfying humans' unlimited wants and needs by producing goods and services with limited resources. All right? So, um, so this is basically what happens on the production possibilities curve. Now, it is important to note, before I go on and show you some other characteristics or some other possibilities with regards to the production possibilities curve, that as long as the economy chooses a point anywhere on the production possibilities curve, that economy is considered to be operating at maximum efficiency. In other words, it is utilizing all of its resources to produce the most that it can possibly produce. Okay, so as long as you are on the production possibilities curve, any, any combination, the economy is considered to be efficient. The, the economy is producing efficiently. All right? And if that is the case, then the only way you can produce more of one good is by producing less of the other. Unless, of course, and that is, I'm talking about at any point in time, eh? Unless, of course, there comes a point in time where something happens and you're able to produce more of both. And that something happening, I'll, I'll get to in a minute. But let's, talk, let's take, pick another point. Let's call this point F. Point F right here is inside the production possibilities frontier. It's inside. It's not on the curve. What this simply means is that the combination, let's say this is 75 wood, units of wooden furniture and 40 units of or 40 gallons of coconut oil at point F. What this is simply saying is that this economy is operating inefficiently. This is an inefficient combination because the economy is not producing the most that it can produce given the resources that it has at that point in time. So it's underproducing, it's not getting the maximum out of the resources which are available to it, to the economy that is. So point F, any point inside the production possibilities curve is referred to as an inefficient point. So point F is an inefficient combination that doesn't use all of the resources. And this point is within the production possibilities, the productive capacity of the economy. So, um, so at point F, the economy can actually produce more of both goods, more wooden furniture and more coconut oil because at that time because the resources, all of the resources are not being used. So they can produce more and more of both of them until they get back 
on the production possibilities curve, which is where maximum efficiency takes place, which is where all of the resources are being utilized to produce the most that you can possibly produce. All right? Let's talk about point E. Let's, let's pick a point outside here. Let's call this point E. Well, this is outside of the production possibilities frontier. And at point E, it simply means that the existing resources in that economy at that point in time would not allow for this economy to produce at point E, to produce that combination. That is unattainable. Okay? It's unattainable because the resources are not adequate to produce so much of both wooden furniture and coconut oil. And now the question may be asked, well, isn't there, can't you get to point E at some point in time? Isn't there something you can do to get to point E? And the question is, well, I don't know if there's something you can do, but things can happen, realities can change, and you can actually attain point E. And I'll explain to you in a minute how that is possible. But just to, to, to emphasize and to re-emphasize that point E represents an unattainable combination with the current resources that you have. Okay? The resources that you have available to you at this point in time in economy Zenga do not allow you or would not allow you to produce a combination E of wooden furniture and coconut oil. So this is beyond, point E is beyond the production possibilities curve and it lies outside the productive capacity of the economy and is therefore unattainable. Because recall, recall the definition of the production possibilities curve or frontier. The description, it shows the maximum attainable combination. The maximum attainable combination. So any combination on this curve is the most that you can produce at that time with those resources and, and the technology, prevailing technology. Anything outside of this maximum attainable um, combination is naturally unattainable. So that's why point E is said to be unattainable. All right? Now, I just want to emphasize also that for a country, for a country to be on this production possibilities frontier, I, may have, I think I said it in, during the discussion, but I want to emphasize and re-emphasize because you need to know this. This is going to be, this is a typical question that comes up in CC. What are the conditions which must exist in order for an economy to be on its production possibilities curve? One, all of the resources must be used. And two, there is efficiency in the use of those resources. And what do I mean by that? There is efficiency in the use of those resources. In other words, the resources must be put to their best use. The resources, the factors of production used in helping that economy to be on the production possibilities curve must be allocated in such a way where they are put to their best use. So, for example, you won't take a carpenter and um, send him to be a fisherman because he's a carpenter. That's what he's best at doing. He doesn't know much about fishing. If you take him and send him to fish, he's not going to be as productive. He's not going to be as efficient because you're not going to get the most out of that resource. His specialty is being a carpenter. So let's put him to do carpentry and so on. And this is obviously simplifying and oversimplifying the concept. And for good reason. Because you need to understand really the basic, basic, basic concepts. Because these are the building blocks on which we are going to develop the rest of the syllabus as we go through the course. 
So you need to understand these. And if it sounds like I'm oversimplifying, well, yes, I am. Because I, I don't want you to misunderstand or to misinterpret these basic fundamental concepts. All right? So if there's um, a movement along the production possibilities curve, if you move from one point to another to another, from point A to point C to point D to point B, or from point B to D to C to A, or from point A, I mean from point D to point C, or from point C to point D. Anywhere you move along this curve, as long as you stay on the curve, any movement means that trade-offs are taking place. Because you cannot move along the production possibilities frontier unless you're giving up something. When you move along the frontier, it means you're getting more of one, of the two products in question and less of the other. If that doesn't happen, then you're not gonna be moving along the production possibilities curve, you can't. And it just shows you that in choosing the different combinations, you're making trade-offs. You're giving up some of one to get more of the other. And it has to happen because of the basic economic problem of scarcity of resources and having to make choices based on the fact that these scarce resources can only produce a limited quantity of goods and services intended to satisfy our unlimited wants and needs, okay? So any movement along the production possibilities curve or frontier simply means that you are making trade-offs, that economy is making trade-offs, giving up some of one to get more of the other. Now, remember I, I talked earlier about point E, which at this point in time, and given these resources, uh, uh, is unattainable. But at some other point in time, or maybe over a period of time, point E may actually, the economy of Zenga may actually be able to achieve point E. But in order for that to happen, it means now that your production possibilities curve has to come out to point E. In other words, it has to shift all the way out here. Let me just clean up the, board, the whiteboard a little bit here so, so you don't get confused too much. All right, so this is coconut oil. All right, so this is point E, which on the production possibility, let's call this PPC1, this first production possibilities curve, and maybe I'll use a different color ink to demonstrate this one. So PPE, PPE1 is the black production possibilities curve, and PPE2 which includes point E in the previous example, this would be our production possibilities curve two. What we, have see, what we are seeing here is a shifting of the production possibilities curve, an outward shifting from PPC1 to PPC2. So it shifts out in this direction. What this allows the economy of Zenga to do now is to be able to produce more of both goods in question, more furniture and more coconut oil at the same time. But that would mean that you have more resources now available to you. Hence, you can your, your optimum level of production, your maximum combination of production has increased because you have gotten more resources in order to do that. And, 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 and how, how is that possible? How is it possible for you, for you to have an increase in, 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 um, in, in, your, in the production of both goods and at the same time? How are you able to have a bigger production possibilities curve? Well, as I said before, and I, as, as, the implication is that there's an increase in the quantity and or quality of the resources. So for example, maybe you have more workers. 
you know, maybe um, a whole bunch of people just migrated to the economy of Zenga. Now you have more laborers available to you. Or maybe um, the economy of Zenga just discovered a huge deposit of oil, um, you know, just off its shores. All of a sudden now you have more resources available to you, you can produce more. Or maybe you had a, um, an education revolution where all of your, or a large percentage of your workforce, um, you know, have increased their productive capacity because now they have become more qualified, you know. Um, so, so those are possibilities. But the, the reality is that if you increase... If you increase the resources that you have at a particular point in time, or you increase the quality of the existing resources that you have, then it's very likely that your production possibilities curve would shift outwards. In other words, your economy would grow because you're now able to produce more of both goods at the same time without giving up one to produce more of the other. Now, and, but 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 the same the same principle applies once you are on that new production possibilities frontier. In order to produce more of one on this new frontier, you have to give up producing, um, you know, some of the other product in question. So so the concept of movement along the production possibilities curve still exists. All right. So. There you have it. I mean, the, 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 the outward shift of the production possibilities curve. Economies always like to see when that happens, okay? The economy is always striving to increase their productive capacity because that is considered as economic growth, and economic growth is usually considered as a good thing. Um, that is different from economic development, and, and in recent times, um, the discipline of economics uh, has been focusing more and more on, on economic development instead of just the strict concept of economic growth where your GDP, the, 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 the total, the, the, sum, the value of the total goods and services that an economy produces over a period of time, which is the same concept here. If you choose combination E, for example, in this economy, at this point in time, that's your GDP. I'm not going to get into that just yet, but just so you know, get familiar with the term because it's something that we're going to talk about later on in the syllabus as well. But economies strive to increase or to get this outward shifting of the production possibilities curve because it shows now that you're able to produce more of everything, to put it very bluntly. In this particular example, you're able to produce more coconut oil and more wooden furniture at the same time, given increased resources now as opposed to what you were able to produce on the first production possibilities curve the black one okay and since you're able to produce more of both it means that people can make more choices or the choices that we have to make may not be as limited so to speak of course you know our wants and our needs would still be unlimited because that's how we are as human beings we we, we have an insatiable or a, a, a limitless appetite, you know, for things, for goods, for services. We are never satisfied, you know. But in this particular example, at least, if, you, if, if nothing else changes other than the maximum combination of goods and services that, that economy Zenga can produce, in this case, furniture and coconut oil, then people can make choices much easier or you would be able to make more choices, so to speak, all right? Um, and again, as I said, this means that even with the same amount of factors of production, more can be produced, resulting in an outward shift. And that's, that's because your quality of the resources would have gotten better as well. Case in point, your human resources, uh, when, you know, they got better training, they became more qualified, they can produce more, um, you know, with, with, with the same, with that one person, so to speak, that one human resource. Is it also possible, the question can also be asked, is it possible to have an inward shifting of your production possibilities curve? In other words, is it possible 
that your maximum combination of goods and services can, can decrease. Of course it is possible. So for example, um, I don't know if I have a, let me just grab a quick, a different color marker here. Sorry that I went off camera for a little while there. Um, so your production possibilities curve can shift inwards as well. From PPC1 to say PPC3. So now the maximum combination of goods and services that this economy can produce is less than what it could have produced in the first place. And, and the question is, well, well, why? How is that possible? How is it possible that the available resources to an economy can decrease? Well, I, I don't think that's a difficult question to answer, especially in countries and economies such as ours, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, for example. All it takes is for one massive hurricane or storm to wipe out much of our resources. Yeah? Um, and if that's the case, it means that we can't produce as much as we were producing before. So, if we cannot produce as much as we have been producing before because our resources decreased, then it means now that our production possibilities curve is going to shift inwards. So now, at any given point in time on PPC3, on this red production possibilities curve, the maximum combination of wooden furniture and coconut oil is going to be less. Okay? So, so for example, on PPC1, you could have produced 100 gallons of coconut oil or 100, gall 100 um, units of wooden furniture or any combination thereof. With PPC3, the maximum quantity of coconut oil that you're able to produce would probably be, let's say, 60. And the maximum uh, quantity or units of wooden furniture would probably be about, say, 85. Right? So you can, you're producing less of both simply because your production possibilities curve shifted inwards. There was a decrease in economic growth simply because of the fact that your resources that you had available went down. And it could be because of a, 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 a powerful storm, a natural disaster, in some cases where you may have huge and long extended wars, a large portion of your population may, may get wiped out, a large portion of your labor force, even some of your infrastructure, your capital goods, like your roads and your factories and so on, could, could, could get you know, destroyed because of a war. And that could, that could also force an inward shifting of the production possibilities curve and so on. All right? So, so just to wrap up very quickly, in producing goods and services to satisfy wants and needs, there are factors of production or inputs which must be used. And those factors of production, as I mentioned earlier, land or natural resources, labor or human capital, capital and entrepreneurship, and the payment for those, the payment for land is rent, the payment for labor is wages or salaries, the payment for capital is interest, and the payment for entrepreneurial ability is profit. And um, so when you, when you use those, these factors of production or these resources, the terms are used interchangeably. Factors of production, resources, the same, they mean the same thing. When you use those to produce goods and services, because those factors of production are limited, we do not have an unlimited quantity of resources to produce the goods and services that we want, it means now that we have to make choices, we have to make trade-offs. And those trade-offs are made and, and can be illustrated on the production possibilities curve, which essentially shows you the maximum combination of goods and services that can be produced at any given point in time, given the resources available. So that's it for section one um, of the syllabus which talks about the nature of economics um, next time we're going to start looking at section two
which talks about production, economic resources, and resource allocation. And we're going to get into some things like defining production, what it means, looking at um, the main sectors and in an economy. You have the primary sector and secondary sector and so on. And then we're going to talk about the difference between the time periods for production, the different time periods, short run and long run, um, the cost of the factors of production, because if somebody has to pay for the factors of production, it's a cost to them. Um, so we can talk about, you know, long run and short run costs, um, the different types of costs and so on and so forth. So that, that is where we will begin when we meet next time. Uh, again, don't forget to, if you have any questions, um, you need any clarification, don't hesitate to send a message to the NDP Facebook page or to the NDP uh, YouTube channel as well. And um, I'll do my best to answer your questions. If you, if you wish to see me in person, um, my office is located at, in the White Crosby Building and in, going into Beachmont, not far from the NDP headquarters. You can drop by. Office hours are usually between 10 and 1 every day from Monday to Friday. And once, um, once I'm available, I'll be happy to, to give you some additional help if you so desire. All right? Take care. Have a good day. See you next time. Oh, 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 oh,